So here's one of the biggest challenges, I think, you know, when you see slow periods in in UAP news, um, you have a lot of folks who are always waiting for that next thing to break. And, and some people have been waiting for disclosure for 30 years, some for 50. Um, and there always seems to be something on the horizon, but there's never been a formal disclosure. And I think the fear is there never will be a formal disclosure. Is that something that you are concerned about? Or do you think that we should just be taking this one step at a time and not, uh, not expect anything, um, of, of that sort of, um, you know, of that sort of grandiosity from the government? Like what, do, what is y'all's take on that? Tim, you want to jump in first? I'll follow up. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that sentiment. And obviously, I see that a lot throughout the community and comments and, and comments to me personally, and just in general. Um, and so I understand that. And you're right, people are waiting for it. Uh, I also maybe frustrate people because I say that's not what I'm waiting for, nor is that my goal to bring about disclosure, nor is that even on my, uh, you know, board, my, my wish board here of things that I'd like to see happen. Not because I don't think it would be really cool and exciting, but I think that when you put that as your goal of what is success or what is the end game here, um, you miss a lot in between. And, and again, going back, Luis has set me down the track. I'm a huge college football fan. So he mentioned football. And so the guys, the other guys, Chris and Michael, I'll tell you, I use lots of analogies. But, you know, nobody goes to a football game for the sole reason that their team's going to win. And, you know, obviously they want their team to win. And when they win, that's exciting. But it, that's a very brief moment of the game. <laughs> that's the end. Even if you win the Super Bowl. You hoist the trophy, yay, yay, yay. You get your, your overpriced T-shirt and hat, and then it's over. And then the season starts again, and it's all this cycle. No, no. All the fun, all the action, the expectation that you might win, all the incredible plays, all the things that you're going to be talking about for years to come actually go on during the game, during those 60 minutes. That's the play. And so I think for me personally, I've never focused on that quote, disclosure end goal, because you're going to miss all those plays. You're going to miss all the exciting action, all the things all that's on the, that make the highlight reel for years to come. And it's not going to become fun, you know, if that was the only reason you go into it. And so that's why it becomes very serious for people. And I think there's a lot of animosity at times, uh, because I think at the end of the day, if it was, it, if any of us had control over disclosure, it would have happened yesterday. It would have happened, you know, 50 years ago, this type of thing. Uh, but none of us do. And so we don't have control over that. And so we chip away at it. We report at it. We, we try to dig up as much as we can. But, uh, you know, I would say that that's never like my overarching goal. Do I wake up and go, oh, they haven't <laughs> rolled out the Roswell bodies yet? You know, no, but, it, you know, there's a lot of interesting and exciting and fun stuff that's going on before that if that ever happens yeah and in terms of interesting and fun things going on and important developments i'm going to toss it to chris here in just a second to touch on the aviation side of this which is something i've looked at for a long time but you know again you know tim and i in fact the very first time tim and i ever spoke on the telephone was like for an hour and then we jumped on the microphone and did an episode of my show and um and i remember one of the most unique things about that those initial conversations, let's just call it one conversation, both on and off the mic in a single uh, afternoon. We barely talked about UAP, did we, Tim? I mean, uh, we were talking about yeah. psychology. We were talking about it was mostly psychology. Tim, of course, you know, having a background in that, uh, you know, as far as his education, his professional background in law enforcement. Uh, but I actually intended to go to school for psychology and ended up, ended up pursuing media. So we both have a, a fundamental interest in uh, the psychological side of all this. And, uh, you know, when you look at UAP, I think that a couple of things to acknowledge uh, when it comes to the idea of disclosure is that, you know, that idea has kind of murky origins. I mean, there certainly was a lot of reporting on the idea that the government was covering up information. And that's always been an, a contention since the early days of this topic. We can go back to the 1950s and 60s and people like, you know, Donald Kehoe, uh, Jim and Coral Lorenzen and others, you know, they were very much of the mind that, Hey, you know, the CIA may be the supreme architects of Blue Book. Uh, there may be other intelligence agencies who are collecting and maybe withholding information from government. Once we actually saw the Freedom of Information Act come into existence, 
uh, UFO researchers, a few of them at least, were quick to jump into the game and to try and start appealing to government through this new formal procedure and process that would allow citizens access to information. And again, I'll just point out, they still do that. That's an integral part of how we as journalists at the debrief operate and how we attempt to appeal to government for information about this topic even today. But when UFO researchers first began to do that, we certainly did begin to find, I think that Dr. Bruce Maccabee, through his appeals to the FBI, had painted something along the lines of 900 pages of documents that they kept on UFOs. Now, where was the smoking gun? Was there evidence of the Roswell crash in New Mexico? There was an actual document about it that the FBI had. It was, whoa, stop that. Tell <laughs> <laughs> them not to call me in the middle of the interviews, and they do it the anyway. President. <laughs> I know, right? No. That was disclosure. We missed it. Yeah, we missed they it. We missed it. We just hung up on disclosure. disclosure. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Every one well, may have actually been a congressman or a senator uh, or their office, uh, you know, because this is, of course, a story that we're following right now at the debrief, too. <laughs> I'm sure. Hopefully we won't call back in the middle of the interview. But, um, again, the idea that – documents have shown uh, an interest or rather the agencies and their documents show that they've had an interest in this topic. That's something that's certainly been known for a while. There was one page on the Roswell crash at, at uh, uh, well, Roswell, New Mexico, that the FBI had one page. Uh, but, you know, that's a story for another time. The more important fact, I think, is that as we began to see what some of the documentation kept by intelligence agencies actually constituted, it became more and more apparent that they collected information, but what they were releasing was not significantly uh, representative of some sort of an extraterrestrial reality. If anything, at times, the intelligence agencies were seeming to convey, well, we, we're not sure what this is or if there's anything to it, but we're worried that, you know, Russia might use it to exploit communications channels, you know, to cause some sort of, you know, misinformation campaign to clog communications in advance of an attack. So, again, there was an, a, a concerted effort to collect information about both the topic, but more importantly, people who were looking at it out of concern that it might be something that the enemy, I mean, again, Earth-based enemies might use against us. So in terms of disclosure, while appeals to government on information it may have on this topic continue, and no doubt they certainly probably have some things that they haven't released to the public. In fact, we know that much. Uh, the question of what that is, I think, coming back to psychology is important because you have to recognize there's what people expect, what they hope for, what they want to see, and then there's the reality. And I've always said, and again, this kind of coming back to Tim's point, if you go in search of what you expect to find, when you get the reality, when the truth is revealed, if it's not what you hoped for, I think what you see is people's, like what we saw with people's reaction to the ODNI report in June. Is that all there is? We expected more. Well, of course you expected more, but that's the difference between the disclosure you hoped for and the disclosure you actually get. Now, what really interests me is how we have begun to see aviation professionals, scientists, you know, congressmen and women getting involved. Chris Plain did some excellent reporting on the aviation community, professional aviation community, and how they are now responding to the UAP issue, which has, to me, been a landmark. Chris, you want to talk about that? Not, what a setup. Really. Just just yeah. tossed it right to him yeah. on a yeah, tee. Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, all right. Well, maybe what what Spring wants to talk about it. I'm not here's what I want to talk about. All right. First of all, quit turning my microphone off. That was you Chris guys. It's the, my, my listen, way. listen. That was Chris. That your, called your room has a very strange ambient sound. I don't know oh, what's going it? on. It sounds like a fan or something is going on in there. So that's why I've, I've been oh, just muting okay. it to get better sound. Don't take oh, it personally. It's totally quiet in here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. You know. Uh, <laughs> Here's what I want to hear about. We got Tim and Micah here for like 25 more minutes before they got to go, right? You're going to have me for the whole second half of the show. So I'll go on and on about that. I want their take on the Gillibrand Amendment and then, uh, and on the, 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 the office out of the DOD. And, and which one should we be rooting for? Should we be rooting for both of them, neither of them? I, I, I'm dying to know here. And I, I talk to these guys at work all the time, but as they pointed out, we're talking about work. We, we talk about what we have to do, not what we want to talk about. So I'm mm. dying to know these two guys' take uh, on that. And then in the second hour, uh, I'll drone on about the AIAA plenty. All right, Tim. <laughs> Tim. He wins. He wins. That was a much better handoff than either of you 
uh, either of us did. I mean, he he wins. I got to hand it to him. Good job, Chris. <laughs> and just for just for further context, so you actually and so Lou Elizondo came out um, and was uh, was disappointed in the uh, I believe it's the AOIMS. AOIMSG. Um, so and, uh, and and I saw Tim. You had you had similar concern. Do you want to you want to tee us up for that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's kind of funny. You know, I think, I guess concerns as much as this, we talk about not having expectations, but this is what I kind of expected. And, uh, you know, people are wondering what's going on. Like, why have you got, now you've got this really broad, robust amendment, but then you've got the government, you know, the DOD coming out of the blue with this other, you know, really watered down kind of expectation of what they're going to achieve. And people are like, what the hell's going on? Is it the cover up? Is it the, you know, whatever? No, it's 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 the government. <laughs> the government is happening. And, and you've heard me probably say this both on Twitter. Or, I may have said it last time I was on your show is people are getting a crash course in how the government actually works. And uh, it, it's not pretty. <laughs> and, and I hate saying that. But and I think to to some degree, you know, the UFO community, some of the some of the more well-known researchers or authors at times have, have done a bit of a disservice because they've given this picture that the government is capable of this coordinated effort in anything. Uh, and that's not really the case. Uh, probably one of the best examples to give you an, an idea of what's going on here. And I talked to this a little bit about with the guys and, and girl Chrissy last night. Um, you know, did anybody read the psychology today article that was published? Was it yesterday or the day before? Micah did. I don't think <laughs> I did. did where was me? where was it published? It was Psychology Sorry. Today. Okay, then how no, did I that didn't miss read it. it. No, yeah, I, I, did, no, I didn't. I missed that. Okay, one. well there you go. UFO Twitter, you're you're dropping the ball. There was a exceptional article done uh, in you in Psychology Today uh, about UAP and, and what it could mean in terms of new science and everything. Uh, the author of that article was Dr. Eric Hasseltine. Dr. Hasseltine is a brilliant man. He, he once headed up uh, Din Disney's Imagineering, uh, and then he was the chief science and technology officer for the Office of Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. Uh, he was essentially the chief technology officer for the entire intelligence community. So very brilliant guy for a long time. And he wrote a great article there, but he also wrote a great book a couple of years ago. And I loved it. Now, let me be wrong. It's kind of right up in my alley. Uh, it may get too technical for some people, but it's called uh, The Spy in Moscow Station. And it tells this fantastic story. And if you want to understand how the government works, it's a great insight into how it works. And the short of the long there is this is a very true, real story of events that happened in 1978, the, the NSA. Uh, discovered a uh, Soviet bug inside the embassy in Moscow. Okay. When I say discovered it, they found it, they removed it, they physically had it. It was an RF receiver hidden in a chimney inside the embassy. Um, they said that the, the Soviets are listening to all of your communications. They told the CIA this and the State Department. And in fact, uh, the CIA had had uh, Russian agents killed during this time because of it. And the CIA and the State Department said, we don't believe you. Hmm. <laughs> and they had it in front of them. Like they could have shown it to them. Eh, no, we don't believe you. And the NSA pushed it and there was this big turf war. And, and I'm not going to get in the weeds of this book, but you really get an idea of how it works where you're like, why are they fighting this? Like it's, isn't everybody supposed to be on the same team? Like why is there this resistance here into this idea that the Russians are spying on us? And the CIA was adamant about it. And the state department was adamant about it to the point where they got a, a executive directive telling the NSA, stop mentioning it, <laughs> stop talking about it because, you know, we don't want people, we don't believe you. And this went on for five years until the NSA was eventually by uh, order of president Reagan allowed to go in, remove a lot of the property that was in the embassy, found the bugs discovered and said, they've been listening to you this whole time. So for five years from the point they found it and for five years, all right. Wow. And there was so much resistance to this and so much craziness. And even at a point when the NSA had difficulty finding these bugs, they, they actually thought that uh, this, maybe the CIA removed them so that they wouldn't find them. 
to cause friction. In fact, when the NSA technician went to do the inventory, the CIA tried to get him drunk and, and had Russian prostitutes because they wanted to know what he was doing there because it was so compartmentalized. They, they, it was that point a code word option where only the NSA knew. Now, picture that in perspective to UAP, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Picture that in perspective that now, you know, adversaries spying on you is a real thing. They all know that's a real thing. It goes on. We spy on other countries. They spy on us. But imagine the resistance to the idea that the Russians or the Soviet Union was spying inside the embassy when you had the proof and evidence. So the U.S. government is a sprawling complex. And now what you're seeing is that the UAP subject is not going to go away, per se. And they're kind of acknowledging it. So you're going to see a lot of infighting here, as in who controls the topic. And, and you, you that's one of the things in that whole... Uh, that caused so much friction between the CIA and NSA is whose job is it? You know, they all say, well, NSA is their job isn't security. So screw them. And it's like, yeah, but this is going on. And so you're going to see this now and you're going to see this now with this idea. OK, well, fine. If you're going to make if, if you're if you're not going to let this go away and somebody's going to look at it, well, then it's our job. But then you're going to have other agencies that are like, no, this is my job. And others are going to say it's my job because at the end of the day, nobody wants to get embarrassed. <laughs> And say, oh yes, this is really something. Uh, it, when it when it could when technically it should have been their job. And if nothing else, I think probably one of the most fascinating things for me, and maybe it's not as frustrating because it's fascinating to me to watch this process, <laughs> is I can't think of a more complex problem to watch a government have to solve, and mm. especially one like the U.S. government. Because it's everything is so segmented and compartmentalized where different agencies fall under different branches. They have different jobs. But you look at the UAP subject. That is something that is government wide. And it is a mysterious problem that, frankly, the U.S. government is not equipped to handle. And so it's interesting to watch how are they going to handle that. Because the DOD, I think a lot of people, when they saw that, I'm not going to attempt the acronym. I, I've forgotten from memory. I don't want it. Uh, you know, they, they cried foul that it, they were only going to look into military ranges and ranges under military control. Well, that's because by federal law, the Department of Defense only has limited power. They don't have the power to operate on U.S. soil, except under very, very strict circumstances. So they don't have authority. So then goes into, well, some of this authority bleeds into the Coast Guard. Some of this bleeds into the FAA. Some of this bleeds into Homeland Security. Some of this bleeds into the FBI. All everyone I just named all fall under different executive branches. So when the, the secretary of defense can't tell the FBI what to do, can't tell the FAA what to do. Likewise, none of them can tell. But to comprehensively look at that, you've got to get all of these agencies that aren't equipped to look at it. They, they don't work together as is. And in, in many instances, they work against each other. <laughs> They're in competition with each other. But they've got to work together to try to solve that. Now, tackle on the fact that every taboo that you can think of in, in anything, any conversation that you've had about the subject with anybody who's not from the UFO community, maybe they've just seen the, the New York Times article or something, or, or they've read an excellent and informative piece on the debrief, uh, and you're trying to explain it to them, and, and they're, they're like, oh, that's BS. Those, that's, now imagine the government. Just multiply that. So you're going to have people that are like, this is BS. The infighting and squabbling, and even if, let's say, the, the Gillibrand Amendment passes, um, who, what office is going to take that authority is something to really look at. But I did. I, I said that, you know, w when I said my concerns, it was more of a people are about to get a crash course into this UFO problem. And then because of how robust, how, how structured that amendment was, um, it, it wouldn't shock me to see not just the DOD, but you're going to see all these other people be like, oh, well, hell, well, we're starting one, too, because we're not going to be outdone. And everybody's going to try to muscle in this. And it's going to end up in this really interesting dynamic where a year ago people were upset because the government wasn't taking the topic seriously at all. <laughs>